festival. We are at Darbar Hall, the heart of the story. Let's welcome our panelists, Anubha Mehta, Suchita Malik, in conversation with Deepa Agarwal. Thank you. Can we have a huge round of applause for them? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the session on the heart of the story. Today, we are going to get to the heart of the story. To my right is Anubha Mehta. She is the author of Peacock in the Snow, and uh, this is her debut novel. And on the right is Suchita Malik, this is her fourth novel, Scent of the Soil. Yes. And these are two very different works. And I am Deepa Agarwal, and I am the author of this short story collection, You Cannot Have All the Answers. So, what is the heart of the story? Okay. What is the heart of the story? How do we get to the heart of the story? I personally believe that the heart of the story lies in the heart of the author. And uh, here's a short quote from my, uh, the first story in my short story collection. Some stories begin at the beginning and some at the end. And in some, it's hard to say where the beginning is and where the end. I don't know if this sounds a little cryptic, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that the story doesn't really begin from the printed word on the page. There is a long backstory, and this is the backstory that comes from the heart of the author and from the author's own experience. And the end of the story, that is what goes on in the mind of the reader after they have finished reading the story. So first, I'm going to ask Anubha about the experience uh, that led her to write this novel. <clears throat> Anubha is an Indian settled in Canada and the title of her story is extremely evocative, Peacock in the Snow. And uh, when I heard this title, uh, the image that came to me was of an alien bird in an alien environment. An exotic bird, rather. An exotic bird in an alien environment. So, Anubha, what led you to write this novel? What were the experiences that compelled you to write this novel? Thank you, Deepa. Wonderful to be on this panel. And happy Republic Day, everyone. I'm so happy to see so many people at the end of the day. I kept saying it's our last session and no one's going to come. So thank you. Um, Peacock in the Snow, the title itself is evocative and indicative of, um, I guess, the uniqueness of the spectacle where the peacock represents all the moods and shades of life and it is evocative of the hope, resilience and the colorfulness that the East, you know, a life lived in the East has transplanted symbolically in the Western world of white snow. Um, it can be, you know, at three very easy levels. At a very topical level, I wanted to write a fun story of a girl called Maya who runs from east to west and all the magical eccentric individuals she meets. It's a story about hope and resilience that comes out from the imperfections of life. 
which was to deal with a lot of imperfections aside us as well as the things that I saw outside. It's also about, you know, at a, like I said, at a topical level, it's a page turner. It's, it's a fun story of a girl looking for love, which is very improbable. And uh, she uh, uncovers a secret which sets her free. So part one is in India, and it's all about haunted mansions and a murder and a girl trapped in the morality and materialism of India and the razzmatazz of parties and family politics. And then she moves to Canada, the <clears throat> depths of Canadian mines and landscapes and the bounty and the hardship that they... But at a slightly deeper level, Peacock in the Snow is you know, how does a transplanted peacock navigate itself in the landscape of penguins? How does that interaction take place? How does that country that is accepting the peacock looks at the peacock and how does the peacock see the penguins country? And at a really deeper level is talking about the three Ps, reworking the power, privilege and patriarchy. That was not my intention, but that is a very strong subtext. So how does privilege, for example, turn on its head when it moves conceptually from east to west? So all the things that we deem as privilege in the east no longer work, for example, in an equalizing society, more or less, in the west. Same for patriarchy. I've spoken about some of the silences and shadows of patriarchy, not the normal issues that were raised where these are not new themes, but issues and isms don't have geographic boundaries. And this book is for, I guess, people from both sides of the globe. And that was the reason I wrote this book. Does that kind of answer the question? Yes, thank you thank so you. much. Well, uh, migration is sometimes a choice, but sometimes it is a compulsion. Now, my own short story, The Path, from this collection, it's a story of four soldiers running away from the battlefield. Actually, they are escaping after the battle of Tarai, the second battle of Tarai, in which Prithvi Raj Chauhan was defeated by Mohammad Ghori. So that is forced migration. And I'll read a very short passage. It's called The Path. They did not seek the path. It found them, maze-like. It led them on such a meandering journey that try as they might, it was impossible to calculate the distance they had covered. Even the roughest estimate eluded them. The passage of time remained the only certainty as they kept track of the phases of the moon, dark, bright, dark and bright again now. That and the fact that all the myths that they had employed to keep hope alive were on the verge of extinction. Well, you know, stories are born most of the time from our own experience, as you have mentioned. And, uh, but I also feel that stories are a writer's quest for answers that might have eluded them in their own lives. And uh, the fact, you know, that sudden things overtake us, sudden disastrous happenings, and uh, my own stories are, have been born out of incidents that have occurred to me or experiences that other people have shared. And these are the stories to which I'm finding the answers. So why, why, what happens when human relationships break up, when sudden tragedies overtake us without any warning? So uh, all of us have our own sources. All of us seek the heart of the story in our own ways. Now, Suchita, uh, each writer approaches these questions in her own style and uses different devices to express the central idea of a story. Your novel, Suchita, Scent of the Soil, is about a civil servant 
abandoning a highly successful career to return to his rural roots. Apart from the protagonist's, uh, Shubhajit's own disenchantment with his life, there are other external factors that reinforce his decision. Can you share the, the stories, the thoughts that help to propel your plot to its conclusion? Thank you so much. And I thank the audience also for being here and listening to us so patiently. And uh, well, I've been listening to both of you with a lot of interest. And uh, well, uh, you have talked about little about the theme of my novel, that is the scent of the soil. It's a fourth novel, and it's the culmination of a trilogy, which I started with my first novel, that was uh, uh, Indian Meme Sahib, which came about 10 years before, which was followed by the second one, uh, Meme Sahib's Chronicles, a story of grit and glamour, uh, the third one was not about civil service, women extraordinaire, uh, where I talked about ordinary women and what is it that makes them extraordinary. But today the topic is a little different and we talk about my fourth novel that is Scent of the Soil. As you said very rightly, Deepa, that uh, here the protagonist, he is so caught up in the web of life and He's a civil servant, he has worked for more than three decades, and he has won the Prime Minister's award twice. He's professionally very, very successful, he's reached the peak of his career. But his family life, he has had to make certain sacrifices. His family life is in a shambles. He, his family has disintegrated, his children have gone astray, Professionally, he may be very successful, but personally, he's a loner. So a point comes in his life where with that forces him to redefine the words like success, glory, courage, glamour, etc., etc. He thinks I'm professionally very successful, but am I really successful? Am I really happy? Is happiness a mirage? So he wants to take a short break and he thinks that you know he would like to go back to his roots and live a simple life he wants to be away from a life of glamour and glitz and great even and he wants uh, some kind of catharsis so there is a twist in the story as we are discussing the heart of the matter well that is the creative freedom a writer enjoys that you know there is a plot and there is a subplot so there is a twist in the story where uh, the older generation and the younger generation, they come in contact, the grandmother and the grandchildren, they come in contact with each other and there becomes a, there I bring a subplot where the children want to know that, tell us about our village because the grandmother has come from a village. Now the children have read all about the village life, the rustic setup, etc or about it's how the civilization, how the first village came up and all those kind of things. They have read only in their textbooks or as lessons. But here is someone, the granny, the grandmother, who has actually lived that kind of life. So a very simple question asked by one of the grandchildren, tell us about our village grandma. She loves the word our. She sees that there is some kind of belongingness and which she needs to adhere to. So they start talking to each other. And she tells how the first village was set up, how it was set up 400 years back, how, you know, there was a common ancestor and how, you know, the, each person started a village, what was a panna? Some of you, the older generation sitting here, would know that it was re referred to a section of a population. And what was a thola? They say, what is a thola? She says, it's a kotomb. Then she talks about the, you know, uh, the major activities in the village. She talks about harvesting, uh, how they would go to the fields, how they would cut the crops. Now the children have heard about, they have read about Keith's Ode to the Autumn, where Autumn is personified as a village woman. They know about the winnowing process from there. But here is a person who has actually lived that kind of life. They've heard about Ode to Autumn, but they do not know what a charge is. 
So they ask about all those questions. So the grandma tells that we used to get up in the morning, we used to take a darati. They say, what is a darati? So it's a sickle. They understand a sickle, but they do not know what is a darati. Then she talks about the morning uh, routine of a village woman, how she would prepare the sani for the, you know, the fodder for the animals, how she would clean the cow dung, how would she would uh, milk the cow, etc., etc., etc. How the cutting of the sugar cane, etc., etc. She needs about the need-based occupations in the village. Say, for instance, the various segments in the society in the form of there's a Banya community, there's a Lohar, there is a Sonar, there is a Teli, there's a Bharbuja, and all that. So the ch for children, it is not a lesson. It is a tale, and they greatly respond to that. So that is a story within a story, the heart of the matter, where both of them uh, listen to each other, they relate. So that is the middle section of my novel, which can be, the novel can be, I'll just take a few seconds more. The whole novel can be deconstructed into three segments. One is the glorious present moment. Second is looking back, delving into the past, and which comes to you, your later question, that the future, they're thinking about the future, how the past and the present are connected, and they're looking into the future, trying to find the answers. Is the answer lies in a balance between tradition and modernity? Or do we redefine all that? So that, is, the, that is how I structured my novel, and tail within a tail and heart of the matter. And let me tell you, it all came from my heart. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for looking so deeply into your work and I letting think, us um, know. Uh, you know, I sometimes feel wonderful. that uh, stories haunt us yes. like the ghost of the <laughs> grandmother who relentlessly pursues Anuba's protagonist, Maya, across the wide oceans the ghost that seems to be dictating the course of her actions. Now, as writers, we like to think of this ghost as the muse, the muse, the benign goddess who inspires us to pen our narratives, our interpretations of the events that overtake us. Like I mentioned earlier, most of my short stories have come out of actual incidents that have happened to me. Now, uh, I want to ask you one thing, Anuba. Yeah. Uh, how do your characters come to you? You know, when characters are drawn from real life, it seems that they come to one ready-made. But in the course of narrating their stories, characters often shift shape. So how does this happen in your creative process? Can you share your uh, process and your work routine with us? Absolutely, thank you. What a wonderful question. And I'm kind of dreading it because I'm not a very organized person, not the ideal to know, you know, there's a beginning, middle, end. I never had the privilege of being um, someone who knew uh, before I started writing that this is what I wanted to write. The way Peacock in the Snow, the way that I write is I have all these stories inside me which I just let out on paper first. And then I work backwards okay, here's something that I have to write. I get into a frenzy. I write, let's say, for five months. And then after I've finished, I cut it, slice it, and see, is there a storyline here, or was I just having fun, you know, with myself? The way this happened was um, being, you know, I did academic writing. So the first time I wrote a novel, and I said, this is wonderful. I have, I can run free and wild with my imagination. I can become anything I want to in a novel because I am the guru and I don't need another subject matter expert. Unlike, you know, in academic writing or nonfiction, you have to know the subject. You have to know, uh, you, it has to be an empirical research and analysis. Here you don't need that. You just have to have a spirit and a gut. And you, so in terms of the characters, what happened was, after I wrote the stories, I was very hesitant and I didn't know where to go to see if this made any sense. So I picked up everyday friends and people in my inner circle and outer circle and I sent them my first draft. And I said, here is a draft, just hit me with anything you have with it. So what they did was, 
what they did was I picked, let's say, a CAO from a small town in Canada who had never traveled out of Canada. I picked a lady on a wheelchair whose dream was just to dance, do ballroom dancing. So different demographics started giving me feedback, and they all said one thing. It's a page turner. We want to know more. But they all said different things. So one of the things I did in the novel is leave it very high level at crossroads so that everybody from their filter can read and interpret it the way they want it. Thank so, you. Thank you yeah. so much, Anuva, for giving us a glimpse into your creative process. We have uh, very little time left. So I'll ask Suchita to briefly read a short passage. And after that, we can take a couple of questions from the audience. This is a very short session. And thanks so much again for being here to listen to us. Uh, thank you so much, Deepaji. Uh, as you want, I'll read a very small paragraph, which will probably give you a flavor of the novel. Um, the journey of life is a progression from innocence to corruption, from primal instincts to sophisticated artifice, from instinctual wisdom to acquired education based on concocted theories, lopsided interpretation, and formulated philosophies. Life is a vicious circle, thought Shubhajit. First, we are in a hurry to swear ourselves from our roots, break all connections with tradition in our march towards modernity, to, immense, to immerse ourselves in worldly pleasures till we can take it no more, or till we reach a peak. And then, then starts the downward slide towards the process of simplification of activities, trying to get rid of the useless paraphernalia surrounding us, learning to terminate false relationships, turning towards things that will take us back to our roots. There comes a point in the life of a man when he wants to shed everything. Inhibitions, pressures, false emotions, modern gadgets, printed word, expression of innermost feelings, etc., till he's left in his true naked form, mentally and emotionally, so that he can take a step towards spiritualism and ultimate communion with God. Thank, thank, thank you. you. That was absolutely beautiful. So uh, can we have just a couple of questions? I think after that, it's time for us to wind up. Good, couple of questions, yeah. So, so my question is uh, related to actually the heart of the story. So, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so, I'm assuming in order to write a successful novel, you have to believe in its message. So my question is, how does your novel relate to your own personal experiences and things that you've gone, to, gone through? And how does that tie into the message you're trying to persuade in your novel? Sorry, I can't really hear. Can you repeat this? So in order for a novel to be successful, you must believe in its message. My question is, how does the message you're sending in your novel or the heart of your story, how does that relate to the experiences you've gone through? And how does that carry out to the message that you want to send? So is this, is this a question about how much of it is autobiographical? How much of it relates to you and what you've gone through and how much does that translate into your writing? I think to say that a novelist is not autobiographical at some point, I would be lying. But having said that, these stories are not all mine. They, are, they were inside me, but they were all these people that I've met across continents. And the stories are for readers on both sides of the globe. So in terms of autobiographical, I would say we as novelists Till we don't dig deep into our fears and our vulnerability and our deepest, darkest moments, we are not able to bring our spirit and we are not able to do, you know, bring our integrity and honesty to our storylines. So in that way, yes, it is autobiographical. In terms of storylines, probably not. 
But always one thing I want to say, the idea, the concept of the story is always larger for me than either the author or the written word. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank very, you. Very nicely said. Uh, I think we can uh, just take one more question. Well, you mentioned that uh, you took your novel to a very high level and uh, left it at a crossroad. Hello? Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, you had mentioned that uh, you took the novel at a very high level and left it at a crossroad. Was it uh, very uh, good justice to the reader? From whatever feedback you have received, whether you have ever regretted that you should have given it some sort of a culmination or ultimate. Okay. Thank you. Very, um, very nice question. Um, so there are two parts to your question. The first is about leaving, was it justice to the reader to leave the um, novel at crossroads for the reader to interpret the, it in its own way? I'll give you an example. I've used the concept of spirits, which is very new, the paranormal. Not all of us believe in paranormal, and some do. So for example, the protagonist Maya is sitting on a chair and she dozes off and then she has a dream and the spirit comes. So those who want to believe in a spirit will think the spirit came. And those who didn't want to believe in it said, oh, it's just a dream. Does that kind of make sense? So those are the crossroads. And then there is a lot of symbolism in the novel throughout that runs as arteries, which connects readers from the West to the East. For example, a stencil tree that's bent and braving the storm. This is symbolism that we have in over here as well as our natives in uh, Aboriginal people in Canada have the same stencil tree symbols on their, you know, artifacts. The same as whispering wind. So whispering wind is something we hear every day. But those who believe in that the wind is sacred or those who believe, for example, coming back to the same example of paranormal, would think there's more to it. That was the first part. And then you had a second part, I'm sorry, um, uh, which was around, um, yeah, so the feedback I got, part one, two, and three, there are three parts to this novel. Part one is in India, and it was written for people in the West. So the feedback I got from my, uh, when the book launched in Canada, in, in the West, is that I wish the entire book was part one. We want to know more about India. And the, and the feedback that I'm getting here is more to quench the curiosity and thirst of people who talk about a family, a young family who migrates to the West, not because they're, persecution, you know, they're fleeing persecution or war, war or poverty, but there's this new profile of educated Eastern people who are going to the West and their story. What are the access points into the Western society for them? How do they receive? So it's curiosity about people like us who go there and what do they see? How do they see the bounty, the richness, the hardship, the mines, the landscapes of Canada, the good and the bad? Does that kind of answer your question? So, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think we're running out of time. So I think uh, we can take one more question. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, as a novelist, do you try more to be original or to deliver to readers what they want? So, sorry, say that again. Ma'am, as a novelist, do you try to be more original or to deliver to readers what they want? No, as a, uh, let me take that. As a writer, you always have the creative freedom to choose your own subject and the theme and the characters, which are all, you know, the facts are all strewn all around you. It is the writer's creative freedom to pick up whatever he or she wants and then uh, give them a little bit of imagination and weave them into a story. At time when a writer writes, I don't know about others, but as far as I'm concerned, well, you do not think all that. You think only from your heart. You want, to, want your novel to be entertaining also, and yet I always feel that it should carry a message. And uh, as uh, I would like to end with, as uh, 
uh, Fitzgerald, I'm sure you are all aware of his name, Fitzgerald says in The Great Gatsby, so we beat on, boats against the current, born back ceaselessly into the past. So if you can connect the present, the past, and the future, well, and still appeal to a segment of readers and audience, I think you have done your job properly. Very, Thank very you. well put. Uh, Thank you so much. I just wanted to add one thing. A novel always runs parallel at a couple of levels, right? One is the immediate level, which is, it could be a page turner, it could be a mystery, it could be, you know, fun. The other is a slightly, if you look deeper, a little, one notch deeper, it's a little bit of the subtext. So the readers interpret the novel with their filter. The, the point is not to be patronizing to the readers, not to give it to them, leave them space for their intelligence. And that's what, if I could do that, then my work is done. <laughs> Yeah, so th that's, that's exactly where the heart of the story lies. Because the heart of the writer has to connect with the heart of the reader. And uh, once a book has been written, I, I, I'm, sh I'm sure you'll agree with me, it no longer belongs to the writer, but it belongs to the reader. And that's where the dialogue continues, and that's where our hearts connect. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anubha. Thank you so Parents, much for listening Shita. to us so patiently thank you. for about something which has come straight away from our heart. Thank you from our heart. Thank you. And thank you for coming on 26th January. I will always remember this Republic Day. We wish to thank our panelists, Anubha Mehta, Suchita Malik, Deepa Agarwal.